so what what so what was the aftermath were, were, did people leave the church like how, how did uh did people reach out to you what was that like for you once you had that big dramatic moment the, th the first thing that happened uh, was that uh, the members uh, had been told I was having a nervous breakdown. A nervous breakdown. I don't breakdown. know where the room started. They were told you were having yeah. a nervous breakdown. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know where the rumor started, who started it, but um, they believed I was having a nervous breakdown. Um, that's what I was told. Um, I was. Um, I was told not to talk to the members. Um, and during that uh, year, the first year, I, 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 yeah, go, actually, I, they didn't, nobody talked, nobody contacted me except for one. Uh, one member of the stake uh, high council who was uh, a friend. Um, he contacted me to see how I was, sent me a message saying, how are you doing? This was about nine months later. Uh, but nobody else. Um, I, I've been told not to contact them. Uh, actually, there's, there's more to this, but um, this is where you come in, because I posted my uh, resignation letter to the state president uh, as bishop um, on my blog. Now, I was totally total novice to, um, to blogging. I didn't realize that it was a public space that could be accessed by anyone. Um, and so I, at this time, discovered through Neil and Karis um, that there was a new Mormon Stories UK uh, Facebook page. And it was a secret closed group. Um, and there was about 17, 18 members of the group at the time. And obviously you were one of them. I posted my blog link. Um, and not knowing about blogging, I didn't realize you had to password protect it. So this is where I think you publicized it. To thousands. Sorry. Sorry. That's all right. That. <laughs> in the end, it did me a favor, but it was a bit of a shock um, because um, all of a sudden I've got thousands of views on my blog. And at the time, I was trying to protect my parents um, and um, them knowing I'd got a blog and um, they would be a bit upset. And, um, and, and knowing that people were looking at it, looking at my letter. Um, they would be um, concerned and get quite angry, I think. So having got several thousand views, I think 14,000 views in three days. Wow. Uh, I, yeah, thanks to you. <laughs> um, I, uh, I phoned up my brother. I said, Dave, what do I do? I, um, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Everybody's looking at my blog. And all of a sudden, I'm going to get in trouble because I've been told not to talk about um, why I left with anyone. And all these people are looking. So he said, well, password, protect it. And so I did. So I did that. And then I was called in by the state president because of <laughs> what I'd done. Um, so actually it was um, my counsellor, um, who was a bishop by then. He'd been called as the new bishop. Um, and um, his first counsellor called me into the office and said, um, Steve, there's a problem. You know, people are um, uh, knowing what has happened to you, um, and you agreed with the state president that oh, they actually said if you, you know, if you if you, if you um, want to stay a member and not resign or be excommunicated, you need to keep your mouth shut. And there I was blogging to the world um, with all these fourteen thousand views. So I did a deal. I said, look, okay, I'll keep this password protected if you keep me in the church. Let me stay. Just don't excommunicate me. And um, and why did you why did you want to stay in the church? Um, it was too painful for uh, uh, my parents. Um, Liz's mother, who's elderly in her eighties, was frail. In fact, she nearly died a few months earlier, um, and we felt that the stress, emotional stress of, of, of this, um, if we resigned from the church, she'd lose hope. Um, it was bad enough that I resigned as bishop, um, but to leave the church completely, um, it could have killed her. So we didn't want that to happen. We didn't want anyone else to be hurt. So we wanted to stay as much uh, initially because of that. So you cut a deal. Uh, I'll keep I'll keep this post off the internet. 
Yeah. If so I'll, you, I'll keep it. If you leave me I'll a member. It, yep. I'll keep it password protected. I'll keep my lips shut. Um, as long as you don't excommunicate me. Okay, cool. It worked. So the threat of public exposure. Um, uh, is it? A, I just have to ask. <clears throat> if a church is true, why in the world would it have to force people to stay silent? Isn't that a weird request to tell people you can't talk, you can't tell people? What does that say about a church if they have to silence people who no longer believe it's true? Yeah, I mean, it says a lot, doesn't it? Really. Um, uh, but I, yeah. yeah. But I, I, for the sake of my family, I, I couldn't, um, I, I couldn't disobey that. So for, for 10 months anyway, I um, kept quiet. Uh, I think I did make some blog uh, posts, but um, it was password protected, so um, it wasn't public um, as far as that was concerned. If anybody wanted to uh, read uh, any of my blog posts, they had to ask me for the password. Um, so I got quite a few emails, actually. That, it was fantastic. That first few months, um, I got lots of um, wonderful, supportive emails because I joined um, all these groups on Facebook that I didn't know it was ex-Mormon, post-Mormon groups mm -hmm. um, that I didn't know existed. And so all of a sudden, uh, I was welcomed with open arms uh, by so many people who are now friends, um, several thousand. Um, and they wanted to see my blog posts and my resignation letter. So I, I did share, but only with a, an exclusive group. You gave them the password and stuff. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. are you comfortable? Like, I, two, two questions. Are you comfortable sharing what those groups were uh, if they're publicly available, just so that others can find support? And then just tell us also what kind of what those groups meant to you to have a support system uh, you know, once you weren't affiliated or active in the church? Well, you feel very lonely. Um, I mean, all of a sudden, you, you've lost your community. So, and what, what, although we live in, in, in a pretty secular country and um, you know, we don't live in Salt Lake, so most people around us are not members of the church and, and never have been, um, but we weren't friends with them. So we weren't socializing. We didn't have any, you know, social circle outside of the church. It was our life, you know. Um, so we lost that. Um, I tried to reconnect and have done successfully uh, with um, some old school friends, you know, um, which has been great. Uh, so that was good. Um, but then, yeah, we, we made um, contact with uh, Mormon VIP uh, group, which is invitation only, Mormon Stories. Mormon podcast, um, Mormon discussions, um, and there was some other groups now that I've uh, no, lost touch great. with. But those meant a lot to you. Yeah, absolutely, um, and still yeah. do. Right. Yeah, I can't. I can't overemphasize the importance of community after a faith crisis. It's just really an important part of healing and and moving on. Well, I mean, it, it, it sort of doubled as, as therapy, really, because. <clears throat> You know, I, you have to, I had to try and reforge my character, um, find out who I was again. And you gain a great deal of insights um, from other people and in discussions and so on. So that was fantastic. Yeah. So what, what um, I guess, I guess the big finale is going to be talking about uh, your getting excommunicated uh, without uh, your knowledge without a chance to attend a disciplinary council. But um, is there anything you want to share about the years in between you agreeing to stay silent and you finding out about your uh, your excommunication? Well, about uh, 10 months after I promised to stay silent, I uh, began to uh, feel like this wasn't, this wasn't right. Um, my parents and uh, extended family had got used to the idea that we probably wouldn't be coming back to church. Um, and so I felt it was safe to start uh, talking openly. So 
I wrote to the state president, I'm, I'm a very upfront sort of person, really. You know, and if I do anything, I want to be transparent um, and open about it. So I wrote to the state president to let him know that the deal was off. And, um, and I gave him some reasons why. And it, it included a few quotes from Hugh B. Brown um, about um, you know, only error fears freedom of expression and so forth. Um, and that the church, if it was true, should be able to withstand criticism um, and questioning. And, um, and then I took my password off. And since now, then, I've had nearly... Tell us, again, tell us again when this was, approximately? December. So it was of about 2011. 10, 2011, yeah. Okay. So it's the end of that year. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's when I took the password off. And, and I've kept blogging since. And um, it was one... Okay, I mean, I came across... Oh, UK former LDS. Now, interestingly, uh, a few months um, after I resigned, me and my wife... Well, I resigned as bishop. Uh, and Liz and I stopped going to church. Um we, I got an e- I got an email from from a friend, an old friend uh, from many years earlier. Uh, somebody had been to our wedding, um, and her and her husband um, had discovered the things that we discovered, and she sent me an email uh, explaining how they felt. Uh, and I read this email and I, I started bawling, crying uh, uncontrollably because. All of a sudden, I could empathise with somebody who's going through what, had, what I'd gone through. Um, and they came down and um, visited us, which was great because we were able to talk about uh, experiences that were shared in transitioning out of the church. And that, that lady, uh, Deborah Edwards, and her husband, Martin, um, she uh, set up UK Former LDS, which is a British Facebook group which is very active and uh, very supportive of, of British members leaving the church. What, what was so it that, that made you? What was it that made you feel so emotional? Just realizing somebody else, I, I, I yeah. could connect. I right. could connect with with them um, and what they're going through, and it, it reminded me of my own experience. Um, you know, they were going through that initial grieving process, uh, the shock uh, and the feeling of betrayal. Um, and I, I remembered my own pain. And it still hits me from time to time, you know, uh, not as often now, but, um, but at the time, it, it, anything like that, anybody that was going through the same experiences would make me feel the same pain uh, again, once again. Right. So, yeah, that was an interesting experience to connect with Deborah and her husband, Martin. Shout and out to Deborah. Shout out to Deborah. <laughs> she's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. She's uh, an inspiration uh, to many people. Now, another interesting experience was uh, I, well, I was actually uh, sent several letters um, inviting me to disciplinary councils. Um, one one time, the new bishop, who'd been my first counsellor, um, phoned us up and said, uh, "I've got a letter from the state president. I need to deliver it by hand." Um, can me and around my wife, what year? And his wife. Around what year is this? This is a couple of years later. Okay. And um, he came and uh, uh, he came to see us. Um, his wife and my wife are best friends. Um, and at the time, Liz had just had a diagnosis of breast cancer. Mm, I'm sorry. Um, so, so we were, you know, we were traumatized by that. Um, uh, diagnosis at the time um, and he came with this letter he said Steve I've got this letter but I'm not going to give it to you and I'm going to advise the state president not to pursue this at this time out of compassion um, but you know what the letter is it's it's basically an invitation to his, attend uh, disciplinary council I said why so because you have publicly um, apologized for your previous racial beliefs against blacks so excuse me so you, you you're saying to me that the state president wants me to apologize for apologizing to the blacks for ever being a racist I said yeah if you put it that way it does sound a bit odd doesn't it 
but yeah, effectively, he wants to call you in for a disciplinary council because of that. Um, and so, yeah, at the time I was involved in uh, a campaign, a petition, a petition to apologise for the blacks. So that was one time I was um, supposed to be called into a disciplinary council, um, but um, uh, they, they did back off out of compassion for my wife. Um, um, there was another time I was obviously uh, involved in the Tom Phillips fraud case. Now, Tom Phillips contacted me and uh, Chris Ralph. Um, tell, tell us who Tom Phillips is really quickly, just for those who don't know. Okay, Tom is um, uh, a member of the church still. Um, he's a non-believer. Um, and he was a state president in Coventry. Um, and he was also financial director for the church in Europe. So he's the European area financial director for the church. Um, he was involved in a fraud case. And he's, and, he's had his, and he's had his second anointing. Ah, yes. Yes. Um, that's very important. Um, so he's untouchable. So um, he asked, he, he's got this um, case of uh, fraud, alleged fraud against the church. But the judge at the time needed two witnesses. So he asked me and Chris Ralph, who's another member uh, in, um, in, the, in the local area, well, he's about a couple of hours away from me um, in Somerset, to be witnesses. Now, we agreed. Um, we were never actually called up to the case, um, but we agreed to be witnesses. So we were named as witnesses if the case went forward. Um, so Tom um, was involved in that. Now, we got, our names got named in the papers. Uh, national papers, international, actually, um, which caused great upset uh, amongst members in this area, including my family, obviously. And at the time, the bishop, the new bishop, came to me and said, Steve, this is serious. You're going to be excommunicated. I said, well, that's going to be difficult because that would be called witness intimidation. And so they backed off. Um, so that was another time then they tried to excommunicate me um, for being a witness in the fraud case. Uh, and um, they tried a, a couple of times since. But um, they've always backed off for one reason or another. Um, they felt better of it. So then it comes to, uh, oh, yeah, it comes to this. Oh, there was an open, that was another thing. Um I got in trouble for writing an open letter to the Helston Ward. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but a couple of years back, they had the, I think it was the 40th anniversary of the chapel celebrations. And I was invited by, at the time, the only member of the ward that was speaking to us. Um, she's a lovely lady who's a bit of a rebel, um, still a believer, but um, likes to do her own thing, really. So... She disagreed with the way that the church leaders were treating us. And uh, she said, Steve, it's the 40th anniversary of the church of, in this area. Um, you should be invited because you're an integral part of this ward or were the history of the ward. Um, have you been invited? I said, no. Well, I'm inviting you. So I really don't think that's going to go down too well. Do you? you know, well, why not? Come along. So I said, no, I, I really don't think that's going to go down too well. It's going to cause a lot of um, uh, awkwardness and discomfort. So um, instead, I felt inspired to write an open letter, which may never have got read by anyone. But I wrote a letter to the ward members, um, didn't tell any of them that it was there, but I put it on my blog and left it. What I didn't realise was that a local news reporter discovered it and the next day phoned me up said Steve tell me about this open letter and so he wrote a story I think it was entitled former Mormon bishop claims that ward members are held hostage by their beliefs or something to that effect but basically it was to uh, trying to reassure the members that life outside of the Mormon bubble was far more wonderful than they could imagine and that we're here with open arms to welcome them. But I didn't go down too well. So um, 
I got a message from several people that you know that um, that, 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 that they were going to get rid of me one way or another. I got a message from the the next bishop. There's been two bishops uh, in the last uh, five years, and the current bishop, who's somebody I don't know, um, I've only met once, um, and that's uh, and he was a state president. Actually, he was a state president after Tom Phillips in Coventry. Um, he was Tom Phillips' counsellor, so they know each other really well. Anyway, um, this guy sent me a message on Google+, Plus, which is Google's equivalent of Facebook, um, and said to, sent a message to me saying, your days are numbered. I'd never met the guy. I didn't know who he was at the time, and he's now the bishop. Um, now I've since reported this to the police, just in case there are sinister, sinister motives. Yeah, that's an ominous. That's an ominous message. And what does it mean? You know, your yeah. days are numbered. Um, and the, the and the, the, the previous bishop had said to me, "The church will destroy you." I'm only telling you this as a friend. <laughs> but uh, so um, yeah, I was threatened a few times. Hmm. Um, so that, that probably brings us up to date. Okay. So, um, okay. So to be fair, <clears throat> you both were kind of intentionally being a burr in the church's side. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Accepting um, to be a witness in a fraud case, I suppose, is a big thing. And writing a letter oh. that ended up in the national news. I mean, those are... I mean, those are probably fair criteria for being an apostate. Would you say that's true? Yeah, it depends on your definition. I mean, I, you know, I've not um, advocated teachings that are in opposition to the tenets of the church, which is their definition of apostate. Um, I have only ever questioned uh, their, their teachings and um, uh, in history and, and repeated what was in the Journal of Discourses and other places. I think they've added to the definition of apostasy something about openly criticizing the church or its leaders or something like that. Yeah, and if that's the definition, yeah, I'm an apostate. Okay. Okay, so so you can see why they would feel threatened by you. And someone would say, why did you want to remain a member if you're if if you clearly don't believe and are willing to cause so much trouble, including sue the church, why would you even bother wanting to be a member? Um, well, as I say, initially it was because of family, but then as they got used to the idea, um, it then became the, the fact that I want to shine a light on some of the dirty sides of the church, some of the bits the church don't like. Um, the naughty to, bits? The naughty bits, <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I felt it was uh, more useful to be exposing those dark secrets whilst still a member. Um, that the newspapers would take more uh, notice of a member of the church um, who was exposing the naughty bits. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so tell us about how you found out that you had been excommunicated without your involvement. So one night, I uh, when when was visit. this? When was this? So this was a year ago, okay. um, in, in October. So it was, uh, it was um, in an evening, dark evening, um, uh, and uh, Sunday night, about six o'clock, and uh, two men arrived, a bishop and the high priest group leader. And uh, I'd never met the bishop before, so um, I didn't know who he was. But um, he came with a letter and hand-delivered the letter. And uh, I said, well, is that a uh, letter inviting me to a disciplinary council? And he said, no, it's um, not a disciplinary council. It's a meeting to discuss your membership in the church. Having read the letter, which I uh, can put online, um, it uh, doesn't mention disciplinary council, doesn't use the wording from the General Handbook of Instruction, um, it says, yes, you're in open opposition to the church and we're going to discuss your membership. 
but nothing about disciplinary procedures, nothing about possible dis um, disfellowship or excommunication, nothing about attending to defend myself and bring witnesses, which is what I was used to doing as a bishop uh, when inviting people to uh, a disciplinary council. So with the bishop reassuring me that it wasn't a disciplinary council, and with the letter not mentioning those words, we uh, went on our wedding anniversary holiday. Um, having said that, I did send them a letter and reported them to the police for religious harassment. Um, I mean, they arrived unexpected and uninvited to my house in the dark of the night. Um, and were I, in, in, in my uh, view, harassing me. Um, so I reported them and the police re actually um, recorded it as a religious hate incident in the UK. And I said, if this carries on, then I will take this further. But I don't want you to have this meeting. Um, I want it to stop and leave me be. And actually, at that time, I wasn't doing anything um, to irritate them. Other than living. Yeah. <laughs> Other than the fact that I hadn't, I hadn't resigned and I hadn't been excommunicated. And you hadn't died. And I hadn't died. That was yeah. annoying. <laughs> yeah. So I'm still around. Oh, well, interestingly, the, the bishop, uh, current bishop, I was told by a member, the one of the only members that talks to us, um, that they'd had a meeting, uh, I think it was Sunday school or priesthood or something, but it was all all the adult members together, and they were all baying for my blood. Now, this could have been after the open letter, actually, um, which I didn't write, send to anybody. The newspaper had written the article, um, but I wrote the open letter, and they wanted, they were baying for blood. What does that mean? Baying? Uh, baying for blood. They were crying for, well, for some... Uh, action to be taken against me hmm. um, malicious if possible yeah. so they were quite angry and this um, member a friend of ours stood up and uh, said excuse me but you're talking about our friend and brother Steve Bloor who was the bishop who loved and served you for seven years you're talking about Steve Bloor how dare you talk about him like this and she left the room um, anyway, that, at that meeting, um, the bishop took her aside and said uh, and told her off. He said, how dare you do that? Um, and uh, he promised the members he would deal with me. So this is the same guy who came around in the night with a letter. And the, what, the same guy who said he would, uh, that my, my days are numbered. Okay. So they brought you the letter, but you declined to I attend... Didn't. I didn't attend okay. because I was away on a wedding anniversary holiday. By this time, it's got to be that the lawyers are involved. Not only have you been involved in the Tom Phillips lawsuit, but they knew that you were threatening legal action, legal action that you were thinking about, that sort of thing. And I'm sure the, the lawyers were all involved, right? Possibly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so... I mean, I, I can only imagine that the reason that they didn't want to use the word disciplinary counsel right. or excommunication was because of your high profile case and Kay Kelly and others, uh, which had got in the national and international press. Uh, so for somebody like me who has been involved in this high profile fraud case to be excommunicated by the Mormon church could have been a big media uh, item. Um, brought media attention, right. uh, bad publicity. Right. So uh, that's my theory. Sure, it's reasonable. So what happened? So that was October of 2015. So about two weeks later, my father, after this supposed meeting um, that wasn't a disciplinary council, um, my father came around to see me at my work, place of work, my clinic, and said, Steve, have, uh, have you heard that you're no longer a member of the church? I said, no. Who's told you that? He said, well, the bishop came around to our house, the one and only time he's been around to their house in about four years, and they've been sick with heart attacks and so on, um, to tell them, to tell my parents, the very people I wanted to protect, that I had been 
well, had my name removed. Their son had their name removed from the records of the church. I was livid. Uh, that, I just went, seems, that just seems mean. Oh, I didn't know at this stage. I'd not Of them to do. Mean of I them to do. I think they try... To, yeah. to, to reach out to your parents so, and yeah. just kind of rub that in, you know? It does seem, yeah, a bit mean. So I then went online and checked with my membership number um, to go to the church website and check if my membership records were still accessible. And a message pops up. You have stated that you are no longer a member of the church. And I had no access privileges anymore, as most members do, to the church uh, uh, membership, their own membership records. Um, and now I'd been a bishop, so I could access membership records. Obviously, having resigned, I no longer had the privileges, but just for myself. But I couldn't access. And, and I, I couldn't believe that they stated in writing on the church membership site that I had stated I was no longer a member of the church, which I hadn't. In fact, in the letter um, asking the state president not to have this meeting uh, on threat of uh, being reported as a uh, religious hate crime, I said I emphatically wish to remember, be, remain a member of, of the church. Um, under, under no circumstances do I want to have my name removed. So, so they, they, they send out spies and stuff. With me, they had a bunch of files that apologists from FAIR, uh, Maxwell Institute, had, had gathered on me. Is there a chance that in some thread, some forum somewhere, you would said something to the effect of, I'm no longer a member? Or... I might have done. So it's hard to know, you know. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, they won't let me see the, the minutes of that meeting. Right. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's all right. But that's a weird, that's almost like a special category. Since when, since when does someone's membership get terminated when they say they're no longer a member? It just makes no, never heard of that. No, yeah. no. So, they, they removed my name from the records of the church without my express permission uh, or request and without a without a disciplinary council involving you exactly at least they didn't call it a disciplinary council at the time um, so the letter I eventually get um, after my father uh, been notified um, so he gets to know before me and I think there's a data protection um, regulation that states that that shouldn't happen anyway um, even if he is my father you know sharing personal information um, in the UK, it's quite a strong thing, data protection. So um, I get a letter saying that I've had my name removed, but no mention of excommunication at all. Hmm. So that's, you know, again, and, and to be honest, at the time, um, I, well, the problem was I, did, I didn't pursue it too much. I did ask for the minutes of the meeting. I sent, uh, well, a first presidency appeal. Uh, I sent a letter to the state president asking to appeal to the first presidency on the basis that they hadn't followed proper procedures. Um, you know, I, as bishop, knew what those procedures were, and they hadn't followed them. So I complained about... Well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the only way you can get access to the first presidency is through the local leaders. So you complain about their behavior and the way they follow protocols or not to the first presidency you don't know exactly what those local leaders write to the first presidency on your behalf and then when they finally reply they do it through the local leaders you never get to see what the response is from the first presidency they just report it locally um, and i'll just say in my case when i appealed I specifically, when I appealed my excommunication, I I was concerned about the same thing. I wanted to make sure the brethren were accountable, and I wanted a letter. And so in my appeal, I specifically said, please do not communicate with me through my stake president. Please send me a letter. Please communicate with me directly. And they did not do that. No, no. Yeah. It's a sham. Yeah. Uh, it's not an appeals process at all, is it? No. Really? 
you know. No. I got an email. So, I got an email from my stake president that that said uh, I've been informed by the by the church that your appeal has been denied, and that's what I got. Yeah, well, I've eventually got that tonight, actually. Yeah. But um, I uh, I asked for the case of the meeting, which I didn't attend, um, and asked basically for asked for, asked for the names of those people who were there, so I could ask them independently what the what they thought the me- purpose of the meeting was. Um, they wouldn't give me that. Six months later, af- having requested the minutes of the meeting, six months later, I received a letter from the European Area Authorities, um, European Area Presidency, um, saying, Dear Sir, as per your request for information about you, we have no information about you. That was it. They have no information about me. Now, I've been a member born into the church, having uh, served in various capacities and as bishop for seven years, that sounds a bit preposterous. Why would they not have any information about me? But that's what they stated. We have no information about you. Now, they're probably being truthful in the sense that it may not be in Europe anymore. It's probably in the States. Or they destroyed it, right? Or they destroyed it. But it's six months. Now, in the UK, data protection regulations require... Organizations, every organization, whether they're religions or charities or whatever, to uh, to give the information that's requested within 40 days. Now, it took them six months to say they don't have anything. I got an ex- okay, wait, bishop wait, you broke up for a second. We'd like to meet with you. Be- wait, you broke up well, for a second. So it said it took him six months to tell you you didn't have anything. Then what? So it took them six months to say they didn't have any information about me. And then within two weeks, I get a text from the local bishop saying, we'd like to meet you uh, to report on the results of your first presidency appeal. So, okay, I said, okay, that'll be fine. Let's let's meet. And then I had a thought, well, wait a minute. Um, I'd like this in writing uh, because I don't know. I don't trust them anymore. Basically, the bishop lied to me about the purpose of the meeting. Um, I don't know if I can trust their word. I want this in writing from the first presidency. So I wrote a back, wrote, wrote a message back. Am I getting this in writing? If not, not I will be making an audio recording of the conversation for legal clarity and publicity purposes, at which I get a very quick message back saying, we're going to postpone the meeting. Get back to you in two or three days. And that was it. So that was five months ago. That was 9th of June. I heard nothing until the last week when I decided it's about time I found out what's going on with this first presidency appeal. Now, one of the reasons I hadn't done anything, to be honest, um, earlier was because of the trauma that I felt having had my name removed from the record of the church. That may sound a bit odd as a non-believer. I don't. I don't hold my membership as that important, or at least I didn't think I did. But but once that happened, and the way that it was done, it caused me some emotional trauma to the point where I couldn't think or talk about the church for several months. I came off Facebook for six months. I didn't want anything to do with any of my friends in the church, in the groups that we talked about earlier, because it was too painful for me to consider so I totally dissociated myself from the church. And it was only recently that I felt strong enough to to tackle it again. And there's going to be people that are like, oh, come on, you, you hate the church, you're an enemy of the church, uh, it means nothing to you, and you're just making that up for a loss um, or something. I used to have to talk to my family, my wife. Um, you know, um, I haven't blocked for a year. You know, the last blog was just after the um, this meeting um, that wasn't a disciplinary council. That was it. Um, nothing since. Um, and there's no, uh, no, nothing to do with Facebook. I actually came off Facebook for six months. Um, it's interesting. I didn't expect to react this way. Um, and I was supposed to be writing a book, actually, this year. Um, Chris Ruff and myself are co-writing a book about our experiences leaving the church. Um, 
and it's going to be called uh, A Tale of Two Authenticities and how we both tackled the uh, transition in different ways. And it was supposed to be published this year. I haven't been able to do anything. I haven't been able to approach it at all. Um, uh, much to Chris Ralph's uh, uh, disappointment, I think, because he was keen. And I, um, unfortunately, um, couldn't do anything. So um, uh, that book is going to happen. Um, now that I'm re-energized and I feel like I'm healing once more. But it's worth it's worth noting that the hooks run deep and the church can even and this happened with me. It happened with Kate Kelly. Um, even if you don't believe it anymore, even if you have moved past it, when the church acts violently against you or dishonestly or inappropriately, it can be deeply wounded. Unjustly. Yeah. What, what's, and what, I, what did you just say? What word? Uh, unjustly. Unjustly. Yeah. I, 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 I'm mildly aspergic, um, apparently, and uh, we take things very literally. Um, we don't like injustice. Um, I can't tolerate um, dishonesty um, in any form. So um, for the church to treat me this way hurts more than I imagined it would. You, you said so, it hurts more than you imagined it would? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just make yeah. it I, I think there are triggers. I mean, basically, uh, who I am as a person um, was determined by my upbringing in the church. Yeah. Um, so, and pe for people to say, you know, you can leave the church, but you can't leave the church alone. Well, no, for real reasons. The reason the, you, Your personality was developed in the church by the church belief system. And to, you'd have to just totally dissociate yourself from your from 46 years of your past or whatever however long it was um and i can't stop being me um and it's taking a long time so uh, it's 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 slow slow process deprogramming yeah. right deprogramming so but uh, we're mo we're moving forward no so okay so what's the status uh, well, um, I was supposed to meet with the state president uh, on Sunday um, and to hear uh, the, the results of the first presidency appeal. Um, I have sent a couple, several, couple, two or three emails to the bishop and the state president um, stating that I only want this meeting to happen if I can have the, re the assurance that I will receive the minutes, written minutes of the meeting that wasn't a disciplinary council, and the written uh, results from the first presidency appeal, and they will not. They would not acknowledge um, that that was the case. They wouldn't assure me, reassure me. Um, they just said, "Meet with us." And that was it. Just meet with us. And um, so I said, "Well, there's no point unless you can assure me that I'm going to get this." This, this written notes, which is a, a legal requirement as far as I'm uh, aware. I've talked to the, uh, the UK Information Commissioner's Office and they're, they're in disbelief that the church can uh, not, will not give me this information. Yeah, so basically the church knows you're preparing a lawsuit and they don't want to give you any evidence uh, to use against them. Maybe. But the, the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, when I complained that um, they won't give me my information, they said, well, the first thing you've got to do is complain to that organization that you have a problem with that. So, well, there's no point. What do you mean there's no point? I said, well, they are, think they're above the law. What do you mean they're above the law? I said, well, they consider themselves to be God's kingdom on earth. You know, they're above the law. God's above the law. Um Oh, I get your point. So they want evidence that the church has sent my information abroad without my consent. Um, there are laws in the UK and, the, and Europe um, about sharing information abroad. Um, and we may be able to pursue that. So that's I'm going to take it further. Um, but I did receive an email today from tonight, just a couple of hours ago, from the state president, explaining that I have been excommunicated so for the first time in a year they finally admitted that it was a disciplinary council so they lied to you they've lied to me for a year yeah 
How does that make you feel? I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to find out eventually uh, what it was. When I, I suspected it was a secret disciplinary council, now I know it was. Um, it makes me angry. It makes me feel angry that they could do that. So they, they lied to you, said that they weren't going to hold a disciplinary council. They held one, they excommunicated you, and then they refused to tell you uh, and strung it along for a year. Mm hmm. But they finally sent me an email confirming it. Okay. So, yeah. So we can move forward. Now, the, the, they've also canceled the meeting on Sunday. So there will be no meeting. Do they say the why? Email. Well, because of my, uh, the conditions for the meeting were that they would, would give me written information. And they said, because we can't give you that information, um, then there's no point in the meeting. So, so it's not going to happen. Hmm. So what do, where do you go from here? Um, I'm, um, well, there's a news, newspaper article that's um, coming out. Um, it's been published online. Um, to be honest, the newspaper reporter um, didn't pursue the angle that I wanted, but he does mention some of the issues that we've talked about um, with this disciplinary preliminary council. He did uh, cotton on to the controlling nature of the church and the fact that uh, nearly every aspect of our lives um, the church gets involved with, including our underwear. So uh, and he thought that was odd. So they, they've written a newspaper article tonight um, about um, Mormon underwear. Uh, <laughs> What's but, the uh, what's the publication? Not, uh, it's a West Britain. I'll put it online. It's in the UK former LDS. Um, I'll publicise it around the other sites. Send us a link. Yeah, um, yeah, it was, it's it's um, yeah, it's not what I intended. Um, but they, it's a non-member, so you know, he, he, he pick, they pick up on things that we don't expect. Sure. Um, you know, uh, I, I tried to emphasize that um, I felt that the church was hiding from this excommunication disciplinary procedure thing because of my association with the Tom Phillips fraud case. Uh, but he didn't pick up on that. Uh, OK, I, I did emphasize the pain of transition, um, the feelings of betrayal when people leave the church and discover all these untruths and so on, um, which he did pick up on. Uh, and he handled that work quite well. But I didn't write the article. Um, he wrote it as he saw fit. Got it. So that's that's coming out next week in the paper, but it's online tonight. Okay. Um, so share that link with us. Uh, okay. Where do you go now? <clears throat> well, I'm involved um, with a group uh, which is um, international uh, called Truth Will Prevail. Um, there's a team of us, including Chris Ralph and um, uh, Sophia Ralph and uh, some Swedish uh, people. Um, there's um, uh, Tom Phillips, of course. And um, basically, we are leading a campaign um, for openness, honesty and um, transparency in the church. The fraud case is continuing. Um, we're pursuing various different uh, avenues um it's ongoing so with truth will prevail um this uh, organization that we've formed we will uh, continue to push for openness and honesty will you share with is there a website for truth will prevail yeah um truthwillprevail.com okay will you share okay make sure that we share that in the description as well i mean a lot of stuff's being done behind the scenes. Uh, we're not very public um, uh, about it. Um, things are being done throughout Europe. Um, as a group, we're pushing things in like Sweden, for instance, there's uh, national uh, articles being published. And uh, so things are happening in various areas. Um, why not just leave the church alone? Why go after it? Why not? Just, and I'm not I'm not giving you the trope. I'm just saying why not just yeah. let believers have their belief and let the church uh, uh, maybe do its thing? Maybe there will come a time when I will. Um, I thought it would be this year. But I, I don't like injustice. I can't tolerate dishonesty. I, I have a, a tremendous feeling of compassion and empathy for people who are caught up in it. Um, I want to try and prevent any form of uh, misery 
that uh, you can suffer as a, in your association with the church. So I, I want to make it transparent. Um, I think the church can change. It has changed in the past. And um, it's only through the efforts of me and many others, including uh, yourself, uh, that the church will stand up and actually start to change and become more open and, and, and uh, more compassionate. Uh, it may take decades, it may take generations. Okay, you broke but, up for um, a second. You said more compassionate. Repeat what you said at the end. Okay. You said... Okay, it may take, it may take generations, it may take decades, but it's only when people start standing up for truth and honesty, openness, compassion, um, that uh, things change. You know, blacks and the priesthood was a massive issue. At the moment, it's currently the way the, treats, the church treats uh, people, uh, lesbian and, uh, and, and sexual, um, at the LBTG uh, problem. Uh, you know, people are suffering. Real people are suffering. And um, that's got to stop. Um, and it will but only through the efforts of the people speaking up, you know, and uh, I'm, I don't know for how long I'm going to do it, but I'll do what I can. Um, when my book comes out, hopefully that'll help someone, even if it helps one person, you know. Do you get a sense, worthwhile. do you get a sense that the church is in trouble in the UK? Big time. Um, what's your, what's your evidence of that? Well, wards are closing. Um, I mean, I, I was told when I was bishop about a year, well, maybe two years before I was uh, before I resigned as bishop uh, by the state president at the time. We were at a special meeting, so there was bishops and relief side presidents actually. And the state president came and, and he said, "I'm I'm going to tell you now something which is secret, only for your ears. Do not tell the members. But the times are coming when there will be a massive." exodus from the church and even the very elect will be deceived and leave the church um, and we went away from that meeting quite worried but you know we were the select few who knew this but we were not allowed strict instructions do not tell the members for fear of panicking them now i didn't realize but actually they weren't telling us what would happen there wasn't a prophecy I didn't realize it was already happening and I wasn't aware of it. And they were just telling me what was already occurring around the world, that thousands of people are leaving. Right. And what's your evidence that people are, in fact, leaving now? Well, you just got to see how many wards are closing in, uh, in the UK. And the number of people joining UK former LDS at this support group. Yeah. You know, we're, we're growing constantly. Um, wards are struggling you know I've got other family members around the world who uh, are discovering um, the truths about you know the naughty bits of the church so to speak um, and even the very elect I know a lot of people who um, can't speak out um, for fear of reprisals um, and upset uh, losing their spouses I know state presidents when I was, uh, oh, just a couple of years back, um, I was approached by the Moscow, state president of Moscow, um, lovely fella, um, who emailed me out of desperation because he no longer had a testimony of the gospel. He was the state president of Moscow. He's the first state president in Russia. And he emailed me for advice on what to do next. While he was state president? Oh, uh, while he was state president. Wow, that's crazy. So, I mean, you know, we're, I was e getting, receiving emails all the time. Now, I've not received so many lately because uh, I've kind of distanced myself uh, over the last year. Uh, but I, I used to get quite a few when I was more active. I've heard Scotland's in a world of trouble. Uh, Sweden's obviously going down the drain. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. What were we going to say? Oh, good. No, it's fine. So um, let's just close. Somebody might say, well, you know, Stephen's just a bitter, angry Mormon, ex-Mormon who doesn't stand for anything now. And 
and I don't like people to have that stereotype. So why don't we end? First of all, let me thank you for your story. Um, thank you for being willing to speak out and share. It's rare that a bishop loses his testimony while bishop. And so I think that's an important story. Uh, but um, why don't you, why don't we end, <clears throat> if you're okay, by just telling us what you do believe and what you do stand for now and what's important to you now and what you think life is about now? Well, I'm, I class myself as a humanist. Um, uh, basically believing in the empathic compassion of uh, most uh, of humanity and that um, I want to push forward um, uh, that um, that side of our nature uh, compathic, uh, empathetic compassion um, I, uh, I, I I like to think that as a society we can um, we can move forward without religion um, so um, anything I can do there to help um, in the community. I, I do more with, um, with friends, friends and family. We, um, we realize we have more time on our hands uh, now that we weren't so involved in the church. Um, and um, I, run, I organize a, a local community walking group, um, which um, benefits people who uh, are stuck at home on their own, and maybe widows or widowers. Um, and I help to um, get them out, and we go out into the local countryside. Um, I'm more involved in the community than I was before, um, and it's it's real. I mean, what I, f I find about the church is it's kind of a, a replica of, of re it's an artificial um, society uh, outside of the, of, of the normal community. At least in Britain, it is anyway. They try to replicate what's in society, but in a very small way. Um, and I'm more involved in the local community, which is good. So as a family, we're trying to do that. How many of your siblings are still members? Or actively? Well, my, brother, my brother's a, a non-believer. Um, the others are still active. The okay. Three, three girls. There's two boys and three girls. So the, the, the girls are still um, in, in the church. Has that affected well, your relationship with them? Um, yeah. Um, it does kind of create some distance. Um, having said that, um, we are a quite a close family and um, you know, we, we try not to uh, talk about the issues that come between us, but focus on what unites us despite uh, our change of beliefs. That's great. What about your children? They were delighted when uh, we left. All of them? Yeah. The oldest was 18, I think. Uh, yeah, it was 18. Now, um, we had problems with him just prior, uh, about a couple of years before. Uh, when he was 16, um, he ran away from home because of the pressures of uh, our expectations, basically, uh, with church. Once I admitted to him, that I no longer believed. You should have seen the sigh of relief. Wow, Dad, now we can talk to each other like normal adults <laughs> and <laughs> normal human beings. So that was good. Um, so our relationship with our kids has improved. Um, the youngest was, um, well, he's now 16, so he would have been about 11 at the time. So it didn't affect him too badly. But they all hated church anyway. <laughs> so it was boring. So it they're very grateful. So can can you find happiness outside of Mormonism? You know what? I got, I, I don't know if you know this about me, but you know I'm barefoot most of the time. Uh, as a podiatrist, I, um, I started going barefoot about six years ago as an experiment. Um, it's a long story, but basically uh, I don't wear shoes most of the time. So I got involved uh, with barefooters, um, organizations, um, I'm involved with the National Trust, which is a big organization in the UK, conserving um, nature and historical buildings and so on. Um, and we have a Barefoot Festival, which may sound a bit odd, but basically we celebrate the uh, potential of the bare human foot. So with judo and yoga <laughs> and various other things. Um, yeah, ironically, um, just after I resigned as a bishop and lost my congregation, and community, 
the local National Trust invited me to be involved with their uh, barefoot activities. So we had meetings uh, where I would uh, lecture to them on the benefits of barefoot for health. Um, so, yeah, I got involved in that. Uh, so that's interesting. So, what if it's what if it's view. raining and it's cold? Ah, it's even better. Um, no, I mean if it's really cold, then uh, I wear five fingers. Those are glove-like shoes, which are great. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we we've made a lot of friends actually. Uh, Community through, take, yeah. through taking off our shoes. So it's been quite fun, really. And so you're saying you, you're saying that there is joy after Mormonism for you? Yeah, you find new things. You know, you don't have to be given a purpose. You find your own. You know, find your own purpose, find your own mission, um, and start contributing to society in ways that you, you never could imagine before. You know, so it's great. Tell us the five benefits of the top five benefits of not wearing shoes. <laughs> well, you don't get bunions. Well, you very rarely. You don't get athlete's foot. Um, I, I don't have, have stronger. Of those yet. What? Stronger are stronger arches. Okay. Uh, basically, you don't need to see a podiatrist. <laughs> um, uh, to be honest, I was my father, and uh, well, my father was really worried about me when I went barefoot. He said, "You're going to lose all your patients." But um, funny enough, I've gained more patients because I'm barefoot because actually people think that actually I believe what I, 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 I live what I believe, you know, and uh, so people come to me for rehabilitation. Most podiatrists just fit orthotics, but I teach people how to fix their feet with exercises. What if you step so, on glass or a nail or something? Now, um, it's a myth. There's less glass out there than you imagine. So, um, and if you can see it, you can avoid it. Um, if it's too small to see, then if you've got tough feet like I have, then um, it won't harm you. So I'm not going to ask you to show us your feet. <laughs> my feet, my, the soles of my feet are like a expensive Italian ladies' leather handbag. <laughs> nice. <laughs> someday, someday I want to see your feet. All right. All right, Stephen yeah. Bloor, thank you so much for joining us on Mormon Stories. Thanks for your courage. Thanks for your candor, um, your integrity, and for your story. I've wanted to interview you for many, many years, so I'm glad I got to do it. Yeah, and to be honest, uh, when you asked me years ago, I wasn't ready. I, yeah, well, that's uh, okay. You know, uh, it's taken me a while to, uh, to get to, I'm not to going this point. In, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> it takes time, doesn't it? You know, you go through the transition yeah, and uh, yeah. you get past the pain uh, and move on uh, yeah. and uh, and find the joy. Yeah. So I'm um, happier than ever um, now um, and grateful, ever grateful for my brother, you know, who started the whole process and got me thinking. Um, so grateful for that. And thank you for you, for your support over the years. Even if you didn't know it, but you're just set, just being there in the background. Um, thank you, John. My pleasure. Next time I come to UK, I want to meet you. Excellent. That would be superb. I can take you on a barefoot walk. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. All right, Stephen. Bless you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you. No, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with you. I yeah. really appreciate it, John. Thank my, you. My pleasure. I know you're a busy man. I mean, you've got loads of. You're being pulled in many directions. I know. Um, so thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate that. It's my pleasure. It's an honor. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye. All right.